Station 1 Jesus is condemned to death. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow. Let us pray. Lord Christ, as we meditate on your passion, May we remember also those for whom you died. Hear our prayers this day. For all who are imprisoned, justly or unjustly. For those who hold others prisoner. For all who are tortured or who torture. For those held prisoner by disease, poverty, famine or disaster. For those bound by fear or loneliness. We pray also for all those we name now, either aloud or in the silence of our hearts. We gather up these prayers in the name of the one who became prisoner for our sake, Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus stands before us, open to our gaze, bound and vulnerable, sorrowful. Even at the end of this long night of interrogation, humiliation and pain, he reaches out his hands in a gesture of compassion. Yet we walk past. We carry on our lives completely self-absorbed and indifferent to the three crosses pitted against the dark sky. We participate in the abandonment of Christ. Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow. Because of the death of Jesus Christ, the sin of abandonment is known for what it is. The willingness of humankind to ignore suffering so that our own lives are pursued conveniently and without interruption. What to us seems like benign neglect is being exposed here 
as rebellion against God. Let us pray for the strength to turn aside from our preoccupations, to see truly, to acknowledge in heart and mind the suffering that Christ undertook for our sake. And through the, that awareness of Christ's suffering, to look on the sorrows of the world. station.
Station 2. Jesus takes up his cross. Then Pilate handed Jesus over to the Jewish leaders to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. Let us lie in wait for the righteous man, because he is inconvenient to us and opposes our actions. He reproaches us for sins against the law and accuses us of sins against our training. He professes to have knowledge of God and calls himself a child of the Lord. He became to us a reproof of our thoughts the very sight of him is a burden to us because his manner of life is unlike that of others and his ways are strange. We are considered by him as something base and he avoids our ways as unclean. He calls the last end of the righteous happy and boasts that God is his father. Let us see if his words are true. And let us test what will happen at the end of his life. For if the righteous man is God's child, he will help him and will deliver him from the hand of his adversaries. Let us test him with insult and torture so that we may find out how gentle he is and make trial of his forbearance. Let us condemn him to a shameful death. For according to what he says, he will be protected. Let us pray. Lord Christ, as we meditate on your passion, we remember also those for whom you died. Hear our prayers this day. For all who carry heavy burdens. For those weighed down with fear. For those living with pain, disease or long illness. For those caring for the sick. For those keeping watch over the dying. For those homeless who must bear their possessions on their backs. We pray also for all those we name either aloud or in the silence of our hearts. We gather up these prayers in the name of the one who bore us and our sins to the grave, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Jesus begins here his downward journey. Down from Pilate's lofty palace, down from the courtyard and praetorium, down the Via Dolorosa and down over and over again on his knees under the weight of the cross. In Christ's saving death, there is the public character of arrest and beating and contempt and execution. But there is also this secret aspect to his death. For Jesus Christ seeks to save us in the external, the public, the visible elements of our lives and our culture. And he seeks also and indeed accomplishes the salvation of our secret, inward and most hidden selves. Jesus enters into our dearest relationships, our private lives. He is the saviour not only in the midst of the love, but also in the face of the cruelty and indifference and betrayal that compose our earthly families and friendships. We need not bring him into a broken partnership, into a ruined friendship, into a lost and cold family. Jesus is there, already there, strong to save. Long before we are disclosed to ourselves as the mistaken, sometimes venal, so often foolish followers of our Lord, Christ has seen and known and loved us. He knows our betrayal of his causes. He knows our longing to name someone else as traitor. He knows that we cannot be sure of ourselves. He knows our deepest questions. Surely not I, Lord. Will I betray? Will I flee? Will I deny my Lord three times? And the answer Jesus gives is this, that he is content to be betrayed and handed over to sinners. He is content to be surrounded by disciples such as we are. Station three, Jesus falls for the first time. Then Jesus began to teach them that the son of man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it.
by a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Let us pray. Lord Christ, as we meditate on your passion, may we remember also those for whom you died. Hear our prayers this day. For all whose tasks and sorrows are beyond what they can bear. For all those carrying burdens of illness. For those fallen beneath the weight of poverty or homelessness. For those stricken by shame, guilt or fear. For those suffering from violence, oppression or degradation. We pray also for all those we name, either aloud or in the silence of our hearts. We gather up these prayers in the name of the one who falls under the cross of sorrow, Jesus Christ. Amen. It was a slave's death, reserved for all who were not Roman citizens, a means of capital punishment wielded as a threat, a torture designed to terrify and control the people who witnessed it. Crucifixion was not a quick or efficient form of execution, but rather one that by its very design inflicted suffering and humiliation, both in secret and in the public gaze. The point of these secret and then public torments, as with so many modern forms of torture, was to allow a victim to live. Death was the release, not the penalty. And on this Roman tree of cruelty hung the Son of Man for the deliverance of the world. The Royal Claimant Jesus is executed by the death reserved for the alien, the slave. Paul, in his great hymn to the Incarnation in Philippians, tells us that Christ did not exploit his equality with God, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. And Jesus becomes a possession surely the most basic and defining element of slavery, the property of the state. But this death 
reaches far beyond, offers us far more than an instance of the dehumanising power of empire. In the death of this one slave, the world's sin becomes the possession and vestment of the sinless one, who takes on, assumes and bears our rebellion against God. Through death, he conquers death. Station 4. Jesus meets his grieving mother. What can I say for you? To what compare you, O daughter Jerusalem? To what can I liken you, that I may comfort you, O virgin daughter Zion? For vast as the sea is your ruin. Who can heal you? Call me no longer Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Let us pray. Lord Christ, as we meditate on your passion, may we remember also those for whom you died. Hear our prayers this day. For all who witness the suffering of those they love. For all who watch beside a sickbed. For all those who keep vigil with the dying. For those who fear for a missing or wounded child. For those who grieve for a loved one in danger. We also pray for all those we name either aloud or in the silence of our hearts.
we gather up these prayers in the name of the one who grew and became strong in his mother's loving care, Jesus Christ. Amen. How often has the church portrayed Mary with every sign of glory and splendour? This Mary is different. A distraught and grieving mother, she is cradled and comforted in the arms of the son who has been beaten and scorned and finally condemned to die a painful and humili humiliating death. We know this Mary from the evening news. She is any of us and she reminds us that our human life is knit up most intimately with the life of the Son of God as his is in ours. The Greek term used for Mary's lowliness is not just any term, any marker of poverty and weakness, but is rather the very word Paul uses to describe the mind of Christ. In the Christ hymn in Philippians 2, it is Christ himself, the one fully equal to God, who empties himself and finding himself in human form, humbles himself becoming like Mary and she like him, the true lowly ones of the earth. This is the glory of the Christian life, the glory of Mary and above all the glory of God himself, the one who is perfected in our weakness. As they led Jesus away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country, and they laid the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, 
yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. And by his bruises we are healed. Let us pray. Lord Christ, as we meditate on your passion, may we remember also those for whom you died. Hear our prayers this day. For those who carry our burdens. For those who stand beside us in times of sickness and danger. For those who shield us from harm. For those whose love supports and carries us across dark places. For those whose hands prepare for us food and warmth and shelter. For ourselves that we may have the grace to allow others to assist us. We pray also for all those we name, either aloud or in the silence of our hearts. We gather up these prayers in the name of the one who stands in our place and shoulders our burdens, Jesus Christ. Amen. Simon of Cyrene is an unwilling actor in the events of the Passion. Matthew and Mark write that he was compelled and Luke tells us that Simon was seized and made to carry the cross for Jesus. But who would take on the task willingly? The question casts in high relief the willingness of the one who has given over this load to another for this short journey only but who has also for all eternity taken on the burden of our sins and even death itself for our sake. Christ declares in John's Gospel, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. I know my own and my own know me. It is Christ's vocation, his alone, to be the good shepherd whose life saves and defends lost sheep. To his voice alone we listen, and to him we are neither hired nor coerced labourers. We are not owned or hired or compelled by him. We are his own. He knows us, and in his turning toward us, we know him. 
He alone is the true shepherd, the ransomer of all the disciples who saw the wolf and fled, of all those who only unwillingly take on the sorrows and burdens of others. Station 6. A woman wipes the face of Jesus. My eyes flow with rivers of tears because of the destruction of my people. My eyes will flow without ceasing, without respite, until the Lord from heaven looks down and sees. My eyes cause me grief at the fate of all the young women in my city. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations, he will swallow up death for ever. Then, then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Let us pray. Lord Christ, as we meditate on your passion, may we remember also those for whom you died. Hear our prayers this day for all who comfort the suffering. For those who minister to the sick and dying. For those who accept the help we offer. For those who support the unlovely and the unloved. For those who go into dark places to bring them light. For those who know in us 
the goodness and beauty we do not see. We pray also for all those we name, either aloud or in the silence of our hearts. We gather up these prayers in the name of the one who is comfort in sorrow and life out of every grave, Jesus Christ. Amen. She has stepped forward from the crowd to wipe Christ's bleeding brow. Tradition has her named Veronica, after the true image, the Vera icon. Christ's visage imprinted on her cloth. Has she been, day by day, a follower of Jesus, I wonder? Is she a bystander? whose heart is suddenly touched. Each of us has been brought here by the call of Jesus of Nazareth. We are all sorts and conditions of people, and we have come by way of the many and varied instruments through which the Lord God has been pleased to call us to his service. But we do not enter very far into our calling, nor into the service and ministry of this particular and gracious Lord, without hearing the danger of this calling, the danger of this encounter with the holiness of this anointed one of Israel. As those who are called to him, we will also stand under his consuming fire, but not alone. For the good news is this. Jesus has gone this way before. We who walk his path. Our end is not dereliction, but great joy. And just like this nameless woman who wipes the face of Jesus, so we too will meet our Saviour face to face and imprint his visage in our hearts. Station 7. Jesus falls a second time. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, 
and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for transgressors. I am the scorn of all my adversaries, a horror to my neighbours, an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I have passed out of mind like someone who is dead. I have become like a broken vessel. Let us pray. Lord Christ, as we meditate on your passion, may we remember also those for whom you died. Hear our prayers this day. For all those stricken and afflicted, For those who have fallen over and again. For those felled by pain and illness. For those struggling with addiction. For those immobilized by fear. For those who struggle to stand upright beneath their burdens. We pray also for all those we name, either aloud or in the silence of our hearts. We gather up these prayers in the name of the one who knew weakness and affliction and yet gave to us life, Jesus Christ. Amen. He falls a second time, forced to his knees his hands in the dust, his head lowered almost to the ground, not yet to the end of his cruel journey. He is exhausted from the long night of interrogation, humiliation and pain. Christians are enjoined to see Christ in all prisoners and captives those who are poor, unloved, unwanted. 
Christ's identification, his very intimacy with all those who are tortured, humiliated and abused, is so burned into our hearts and minds that when Christians face the terrible fact of torture and abuse of prisoners in our own day, as in every age, we find set before us the image of Jesus. And we understand that Jesus Christ is sinned against in every cruelty visited against any captive. We recognize that torture Assault on human dignity belongs to every age. It is as ancient as the servant songs of Isaiah, lamenting the torment of ancient Israel. Indeed, the horror and desecration of God's creatures is as old as Abel's blood crying out from the ground and Tamar's despair at the violence from her brother Amnon's hand. that all human creatures are sinners is a maxim of both testaments of the christian bible israel has abandoned the widow and the orphan and peter and judas have betrayed the lord they loved and all of us have gone astray like lost sheep to mock to scorn to abuse and torment these creatures, beloved of God, redeemed by his suffering and his outstretched arm, is to mock God and his loving kindness. Those who tortured our Lord did this once, long ago, as did all those who stood as witnesses to the crucifixion. May we Christians sinners all repent of these acts and learn of them no more Station 8. Jesus meets the women of Jerusalem. A great number of the people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. Or if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry?
the elders of daughter Zion, sit on the ground in silence. They have thrown dust on their heads and put on sackcloth. The young girls of Jerusalem have bowed their heads to the ground. Let us pray. Lord Christ, as we meditate on your passion, may we remember also those for whom you died. Hear our prayers this day. For all who face darkness in their lives. For those who fear for themselves and their future. For those grief stricken, for their children and grandchildren. For those who live in times of war and strife. For those who live in places of famine or disaster. We pray also for all those we name, either aloud or in the silence of our hearts. We gather up these prayers in the name of the one who tasted sorrow for our sake, Jesus Christ. Amen. Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. What is this word of woe, this message of darkness? We ordinarily think of Almighty God and his word revealed in Holy Scripture as the source of light and not darkness, of peace, redemption and weal and not of woe. And yet one of the lessons of our adulthood as Christians is the reality, perhaps even the inevitability, of darkness and woe in our own lives and in the lives of the nations of the world. What does it mean for us to suffer pain, to lose someone we love, to suffer disappointment in ourselves, to examine our lives before God and taste the bitterness of failing to love God and neighbour above self? by these shadows that have fallen across our lives. These are a school for us all. We do not read off the answers for these problems like simple sums. We are instructed, loved and fed at the hand of one who tasted the bitter cup to the end, who knows our lot, who takes us for his own. In the life and death of Jesus Christ, we can see the one true and dazzling place where God has said, I form light and create darkness. I make weal and create woe. 
I, the Lord, do all these things. Station 9, Jesus Falls a Third Time. Then deep from the earth you shall speak, from low in the dust your word shall come. Your voice shall come from the ground like the voice of a ghost, and your speech shall whisper out of the dust. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Let us pray. Lord Christ, as we meditate on your passion, may we remember also those for whom you died. Hear our prayers this day. For all those who are brought low. For those imprisoned by despair. For those with no hope for recovery or healing. For those ground down by poverty, fear or illness. For those who are wounded by oppression, violence or degradation. We pray also for all those we name, either aloud or in the silence of our hearts. We gather up these prayers in the name of the one who went down to the dust, that we might be exalted. Jesus Christ. Amen.
This time, the third time, Jesus falls to the ground. His blood from thorn and lash and rope mingles with the dust. And we are reminded of that first blood shed, that primal act of violence, brother against brother, and of God's cry to Cain, what have you done? So the blood that is spilled out onto the ground by Cain's hands, by our own hands, does not remain silent. It enters into the creation itself, the mouth of the earth. God calls us to open our ears, to hear the blood of Abel, the brother whose sacrifice was pleasing to God and thus incited Cain's murderous wrath. But while we all share in Cain's sin, we no longer fall under Cain's indictment. For we have as our guide and salvation the voice of the true and pleasing sacrifice, the true keeper of the sheep, the one whose blood poured out onto the earth is our own health and hope. Station 10. Jesus is stripped of his garments. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell on the ground and worshipped. He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord Christ, as we meditate on your passion, may we remember also those for whom you died. Hear our prayers this day. For all those who are stripped and exposed,
or those who have lost their homes and possessions. For those who are shorn of their name and reputation. For those whose sense of their own worth has been taken from them. For those without health or home or companionship. We pray also for all those we name, either aloud or in the silence of our hearts. We gather up these prayers in the name of the one who emptied himself and took the name of a slave, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Here, at the end of this terrible journey, Jesus is stripped of his garments. And how are we to think of this, those of us in a society so full of possessions? To have to do with him, with Jesus Christ, is to glimpse the shattering truth of his dispossession, of his trial, of his grief. And this truth of the way of the cross fills a rich young man, fills Jesus' disciples, and fills us with anguish. But marvellously, graciously, Jesus bears even that sorrow to his crucifixion. On his cross, Jesus takes for his very own the fear and anguish, the poverty and lack that every disciple exhibits. Though the rich young man abandons Jesus, Jesus does not forsake him or us. The cross of Christ is for the rich young man and for us in our possessions and in our poverty in our disobedience, fear and greed. Jesus commands and calls us, but also delivers us. May we this day truly hear his word and follow where he leads. Station 11. Jesus is nailed to the cross. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right 
and one on his left. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Lord Christ, as we meditate on your passion, May we remember also those for whom you died. Hear our prayers this day for all those who are pierced by fear. For those scourged by poverty or disease. For those transfixed by anger, hatred or self-loathing. For those held hostage by oppression or prejudice. We pray also for all those we name either aloud or in the silence of our hearts. We gather up these prayers in the name of the one who accepted the cross and its shame for our sake, Jesus Christ. Amen. We watch in horror as blow by blow the nail is driven into his hand. Stretching out our hands to touch another is surely one of our earliest and most intimate gestures. We know that to walk into our nursing homes, our shelters, our hospital wards can be entering places where human touch has been absorbed almost entirely by the technical the hygienic, the bureaucratic, not touching of patients. There is a loneliness for those whose wounds are only touched antiseptically.
Think of those then that crowded into Jesus. They stretched out their hands to him. Jesus of Nazareth, have pity on us. And the gracious presence and action of Jesus during the whole of his life was to touch, to bend himself down to the wounds and the wounded of this earth and lift them up. We are our Lord's own. Each of us has our own wounds, and surely each of us longs for his touch, longs to cast ourselves into his wounds. As we see the wounds of inflicted in Christ's body, may we remember also his transfigured wounds, his gracious invitation to us to cast ourselves, our sorrows and our brokenness, into those very wounds for healing. Station 12, Jesus dies on the cross. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly, this man was innocent. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Let us pray. Lord Christ, as we meditate on your passion, may we remember also those for whom you died. Hear our prayers this day for those who are crucified, for those held in solitary confinement,
for all those tortured and slain by a perversion of justice. For those executed. For those who torture. For those who kill. We pray also for all those we name, either aloud or in the silence of our hearts. We gather up these prayers in the name of the one who was a prisoner and died between thieves, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. It is the great and powerful mystery of our faith that Jesus Christ, the only begotten before all worlds, is among us, as one of us, unique among all living, yet he lives and moves among us. Always alone, he is never alone. In life he is always surrounded, always with others, with his community of disciples, with followers both true and false, with crowds desperate and hungry pressing upon him. At the hour of his death he is flanked by others, hung with a criminal on either side. Just as he stood among followers and skeptics in the temple and healed within its gates, and taught the crowds in Judea and Galilee. So in his death on Golgotha, he is between the others, indeed in the very midst of them and of us. Jesus Christ, our present Lord, was content to be given over into sinners' hands, to be lost among the outcast, to be forgotten among the rejected, not just in that time and place, the Jerusalem of Caesar's day, but in our own day as well. Consider the lost and forsaken ones for whom our Lord is content to die. Migrant workers, poor tenant farmers, the mother whose weary face tells us of despair, the victims of violence, armed conflict, oppression, those in pain or terror or sickness or desperate need. All of this suffering, all of these crosses, but none of them is Christ's own. None of these sufferings and horrors is his own affliction. Christ bears our sins, bears them as the very Lamb of God, the innocent made to be sin for us. Yet he does not go to his cross without his disciples, without the soldiers, without the criminals, without the forsaken, without each of us. He is in the midst of them. He is in the midst of us.
station 13. Jesus is placed in the arms of his mother. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, this child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. A voice is heard in Rama, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Let us pray. Lord Christ, as we meditate on your passion, may we remember also those for whom you died. Hear our prayers this day. For all those who mourn the death of one they loved. for those who hold in their arms the body of a loved one. For those who feel their lives broken and shattered. For those who cannot see their life beyond this death. For those who cannot grieve or weep. We pray also. For all those we name aloud or in the silence of our hearts. We gather up these prayers in the name of the one born of Mary and born by her at the end, Jesus Christ. Amen. We wonder, does she recall Simeon's prophetic words? And the sword will pierce your own soul too. 
and has she carried in her heart for all these years a prescient awareness of this death? In this foreknowledge, Mary is unique, unique among women, as her son is unique, alone of all men, God incarnate. And so the church has rightly shown Mary clothed in every high honour, with gold, ermine, velvet. But Mary is also every woman, every mother, every wife, every daughter, every sister, who is vulnerable through the suffering of those she loves. Mary is the mother of the whole human race. She is Rachel, mourning in Rama, the city of death. She lifts up her voice in the rubble of Dresden and Shiloh and Hiroshima weeping for her children who are not. She wanders the waste places, the lost and forgotten lands, from Juba and Bor in South Sudan, to the killing fields of Cambodia and the Ukraine, daring to look into the mass graves we ignore, refusing to be consoled, refusing to forget, at the edge of every slave market, before every faceless citadel of state terror and deportation, Mary stands at the foot of every Calvary, weeping for her son, for her children, the boy soldiers, the raped and brutalized girls, the soulless murderers, each one beloved by some mother, some Rachel, grieved and unconsoled. Mary lives in every place. As with Rachel, Rama is Mary's home, for Rama is the name of death, the site of deportation, the place of exile. Every citizen on this earth knows Rama, this city of our own folly and rage and deadly fear. Every citizen on earth knows this place. Every one of us in the human family shares Mary's lamentation. But Christ came to earth, to Rama, for just this purpose, for just this work to bring his matchless light into our darkness and to take our exile and death for his very own. To summon us out of death and into life. Station 14. Jesus is laid in the tomb. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth, and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. 
Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where the body was laid. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Let us pray. Lord Christ, as we meditate on your passion, may we remember also those for whom you died. Hear our prayers this day. For those with lives cut short, For those who die unmourned, outliving everyone they knew or loved. For those who die in peace and hope. For those who die in fear or pain, or suffering. For those who stand watch at the grave. For those who fear the finality of this loss. We pray also for all those we name, either aloud or in the silence of our hearts. We gather up these prayers in the name of the one who went down to the dust, that we might rise, our living Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen.
The psalmist tells us that the people love Jerusalem's very rubble, her toppled stones, her empty sanctuary stripped of every bit of cloth and every vessel, every bowl and altar and holy thing. They grieve her ruin like a death visited upon an entire nation. but not so with Christ's body, the very body that his followers cradle is resurrected. For that body is the temple, the tabernacle, the heavenly Jerusalem. Listen to that heavenly voice Christ, the one despised, tortured and killed through a defiling and shameful death. The one laid in haste in another's tomb looks upon us and all earthly creatures. With wounded hands and feet and side, he tells each of us with healing in his voice, be made clean. Over and against that death he shows us heaven, that great city bathed in the light of grace that comes down to us and establishes itself here with us. Listen to his voice. Heaven is the city of the Lord God and before him all are clean. Let us pray. O Lord God, our times are in your hands. You alone know in full the seasons of our lives, the days of joy and strength renewed, the night seasons of sorrow and aching loss, the quick exultation of gifts given and received, the light restored after sickness or wrong, you encompass them in your greatness, O Lord. You alone make them small, at rest in the palm of your hand. Bring us, we pray, into your presence, where this pilgrimage of ours will end. Let this way of the cross rise up to your throne, and may we even now glimpse our little deaths turned over into life, even as your son went down among the lost to bring up the prisoners and set them free. Make his way a blessing and guide for us and grant us grace to be light along this way for those who have wandered away and to welcome them home as you have welcomed us. All this we ask in the name of the one who is Lord of all seasons and days the man of sorrows and Lord of glory, even Jesus Christ. Amen.